So today, the focus will be more on um, opportunities and challenges of forecasting marine heat waves. And then I will um, kind of lay out some of the current work that's going on, but also talk about um, OSHTRAC and how we're using that to better understand how marine heat waves evolve and move throughout the ocean. And so I'll just start with um, some motivation for why we, we want to be able to forecast these marine heat waves. Um, and that's because they really have such a big economic uh, impact to marine fisheries and, and even tourism and the livelihoods of different people. And so these marine heat wave events can be very severe and cost millions to billions of dollars a year. Um, here is just a schematic showing you how uh, different impacts can affect uh, socioeconomic systems. And the one we might think most about are the impacts to fisheries. And so temperature driven changes in the um, phenology or the different timing when fisheries um, harvest their catch can be influenced by these temperature extremes. And so um, this has led to uh, declines in value for certain uh, uh, fishery species and even tensions between borders. So um, anticipating these heat waves will not only help managers uh, uh, kind of adjust the timing of these, these fish, fisheries and when they go out to harvest, but can also help mitigate um, the cost effect or the impacts to the cost of these uh, different changes. And, and there might be new opportunities too with these warmer temperatures. Another one is that uh, warmer temperatures can negatively impact kelp forest and seagrass meadows. And so when you transition um, an ecosystem from a lush kelp seagrass environment to more of a barren environment, it can reduce the effectiveness to um, kind of mitigate the impacts of, of coastal surges and, and storms hitting the coast. And, it, and with that, with the decrease in kelp and, and seagrass, it can reduce the carbon capture, um, effectively pulling out the, the carbon dioxide from the water. Um, and then you might be more familiar with the impact of warming temperatures on coral reefs. Um, and so when heat waves occur, there can be coral bleaching that occurs in certain areas. And so that's less attractive to people on vacation. And so you might have a loss in tourism um, and then an opportunity for invasive species to come and um, kind of shift regimes from one um, ecosystem to the next. And so this impacts the bottom line of a lot of businesses um, financially, but also it affects the livelihoods of different people. And so traditions that are passed down through generations um, can be impacted due to marine heat waves. And on some of these slides, I'll have um, supporting content with some um, references. And at the end of the talk, I have a page with those references. If you want to read further, um, you can look for those. So the idea is that forecasting marine heat waves will not only help safeguard our livelihoods, but also secure our economies and better prepare us for a future when these events are going to become more frequent and longer lasting. All right, so some questions that I think forecasts will help us answer. You know, the, um, one is, will there be a marine heat wave in the very near future? And if so, when? And what areas will be affected? Um, we might want to know how intense or persistent or large scale that event will be. And if there are compounding risk factors, we might want to um, know about those. So say, um, you know, is there a coral reef nearby that would be particularly vulnerable? Um, is there a storm passing by that will also increase uh, kind of the stressors in that environment? And, and managers can do things to alleviate those other stressors that we have more control over rather than the, the marine heat wave itself. And then lastly, we wanna know, you know, should I take action as a manager? And that action is gonna look very different depending where you are and the type of environment that you're, you're managing. Um, some of the challenges to forecasting, and this isn't a comprehensive list, these are just ones that I, I thought of. Um, we're in a climate that is non-stationary, meaning that the baselines um, that we consider today will not be the baselines in the future. So as the climate warms, our new normal will change with that um, increasing trend. Also, the um, 
the noise or the variability that we experience today might not look the same in the future. And so those are, um, you know, concerns in how our models will be able to accurately um, represent the changes or the conditions that we're going to experience in the future. We also, if you think about it, we don't have many case studies to base kind of broad assumptions off of. Uh, our observational record is fairly short. You know, you're looking at 70 years or so. And so um, we need more examples or realizations of Earth's past climate to kind of make better projections into the future. And then, um, you know, not all marine heat waves are like, they're gonna vary in their severity, their duration, um, how they're formed. And so you can't, that's again, again with the too few realizations is that we, we need more samples of what marine heat waves look like and how that might change. Uh, often the data is pretty sparse, uh, both spatially and temporally. And so it's hard to really get accurate estimates near the coast and on um, time scales of like a few hours. And then a big one is that uh, marine heat waves don't just occur in one place. They often move around either both laterally, um, you know, north, south, east, west, or even to depth. And so that's something I focus my research on is trying to characterize how those marine heat waves move. Um, just really quickly, some tools that we have to um, kind of make forecasts of marine heat waves. There's, you know, different categories. Again, this is just a few examples. So one is seasonal forecast. So this is an example where they took a multi-model forecasting system of global climate models that are initialized every month and run out to about a year. Um, the nice thing with this is that each of these eight models that is in this ensemble um, are perturbed by just slight variations in some parameter. Usually it's atmospheric temperature. And that's enough for these different models to kind of run with their own scenarios into the future. And so you have a better sense of what might be possible um, a few months down the road. And these work pretty well. They beat just the regular um, persistence forecast saying the conditions today will be like the conditions tomorrow. And so there is some value in these forecasting methods. Um, the other one are looking at climate projections. So this is looking out 50, 60, 100 years into the future of how marine heat waves might change. And this might not necessarily be helpful for a fishery manager concerned about next spring's conditions, but this gives us a sense of how marine heat waves are going to change due to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And this is done again with an ensemble of different global climate models. Um, about 34 in this case. And then lastly here, I have an example of some statistical forecasts. And so this is often done with machine learning or other statistical models. And this really makes um, use of the covariance between different variables that are related to marine heat waves. So a big one is the upper ocean heat content and looking at patterns in the data over time and space and being able to project out um, a season of what the temperature might be. And this is a very promising area of research, but again, it's very, very active. And I think we'll, we'll see more research coming from this particular method going forward. Um, but what I wanted to talk about for the remainder of the talk, um, which I realize is not much time left, is thinking about how these marine heat waves evolve in, in time and space. And you know, from this schematic, uh, this image, you see that those anomalies don't stay in one place. They're passing through, um, for instance, this X, this green X in the Northeast Pacific. And so if we take a view where we just construct a box around some particular area, like this figure here, we might miss some of the story of where that heat is going um, and, and as it passes through and moves around. And so one way to overcome this is a um, approach I take called OSTRAC. And I'm not going to go through it because of time, but if you have questions, um, please ask me. I'll just kind of go through it briefly. But uh, we start with the sea surface temperature. And essentially, we want to just find the points that exceed some threshold that is considered a marine heat wave. So here at this upper map, I'm extracting the really extreme sea surface temperature points. Once we have that, um, it's a very pixelated and noisy map. We want to find contours around these really intense pixels that we can then define as a marine heat wave. To do that, we use image processing. We pass it through um, a series of different operations, which I'm not going to go into detail. But we, we come um, 
after this process, we now have this closed contour um, mask essentially for this marine heat wave that we can then compute the area of, we can then compute the intensity, how long that, that blob hung around and, and track it throughout the ocean. So that essentially is what OSHTRAC does. And we do this over the entire observational record. So now we have kind of this new data set of past events. And just to look at an example here, this is the 2012 Gulf of Maine marine heat wave. Um, it occurred during the summer between um, April and November. It was about eight months. And this is pretty much what we, um, we, come, we, we expect, um, knowing how this event evolved. And so this is what OSTRAC finds. And it's a very localized event. It's not moving around too much, um, but we're able to track it. And so it's freely evolving. We're able to characterize its, um, its evolution in both time and space. Um, this map on the bottom is just its cumulative intensity over its lifetime. Um, so you can see where that uh, warm blob was um, most severe. So another example I wanted to show quickly was the blob. So this was the warming event in the Northeast Pacific, it lasted multiple years. And our tracking algorithm actually traces this back all the way to July, 2013. And you can see how almost nearly global this event was. It was really driven in large part due to the El Nino and the tropical Pacific. And so that really helped it persist for as long as it did. Um, but we tracked this event for 53 months, which is really remarkable. Um, it really had a huge impact and it stood out from all the other um, marine heat waves that we identified. All right, so what can we do with this information? Well, now we have this new, these new metrics that we can then characterize marine heat waves. Um, and so here I'm just showing you the, um, how the distributions are different for the intensity, duration, and area of marine heat waves. Um, but, and then over time, you can see how certain events stand out against the record, the observational record. So you can see how unusual that blob in the Pacific was compared to the Gulf of Maine for intensity. Um, you can see how long lasting that blob was compared to the Gulf of Maine for duration and just the area. So really the, the Northeast Pacific blob was such a remarkable and kind of unprecedented event. And we, we find this um, to be true with looking at OSHTRAC. So it really reconfirms um, some of the speculations we had before. Um, one last thing I wanted to kind of touch upon was this importance that marine heat waves occur over a continuum of intensities and durations. And what I mean by that is that um, you can define a marine heat wave, but each one is not going to be the same. So here's a really nice schematic from a paper um, by Eric Oliver and his co-authors that look, they, they're looking at different events uh, based on the observational record. And so See here, you can see the location in the year and each event, although they're all considered marine heat waves, some of them are more intense than others or last longer. And then the area is encoded by the size of the circle in the plot. And this really gives a good perspective of this continuum over which marine heat waves occur. Um, you can also look at this as, as a probability. And so you can see that the, the probability of a certain marine heat wave is really dependent on um, how intense it is and how long lasting it is. And typically um, short-lived intense marine heat waves um, are a little more likely than the long lasting marine heat waves like the blob. And then lastly, um, this figure probably requires a little bit of time to go through. It's just showing you how important the tropical Pacific is in determining the duration of marine heat waves, particularly in the Northeast Pacific. And so this is just looking at multiple cases of marine heat waves that last anywhere from five months to 20 months and how it maps onto um, a North Pacific sea surface temperature index and the El Nino index. And so um, when, the, um, nor when the tropical Pacific is really warm in an El Nino case, it favors marine heat waves in the Northeast Pacific that last longer. And there's many reasons for that that have to do with atmospheric and oceanic teleconnections. Okay, to, summar to summarize here, uh, we would like forecast to um, safeguard the livelihoods of people and secure economies by protecting living marine resources. 
Um, forecasting really is a, a very new and active area of research. I know there's a lot of ongoing projects right now that are um, almost done their, their development. And so I would be on the lookout for, for new papers coming out. I, I know of at least two that uh, look very exciting and, and promising. Uh, there's many approaches and tools we can use for these near-term forecasts as well as long-term projections. And it really comes from this community of climate model modelers that are making their data available um, to the public. So we can sample um, kind of the distribution of what marine heat waves might look like in the future. Uh, marine heat waves are not stationary, meaning they, they don't just happen at one point in the ocean, but they move through um, both laterally and with depth. Uh, and that's the goal of, of OSTRAC is to characterize that movement. Um, no two marine heat waves are alike. They occur over this continuum of different intensities, durations, and areas. And then lastly, um, there are certain aspects of marine heat waves that are more or less predictable. And that really depends on their drivers the predictability of those drivers and even the location. And so we know that in the Northeast Pacific, El Nino is really important in determining how long lasting those, that, those marine heat waves are in that area. Um, oh, and I have one more. So yep, the tropics heavily influence the evolution of marine heat waves and that's usually through um, atmospheric teleconnections and even oceanic ones as well. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and hopefully leave time for questions. This is the list of um, papers that I mentioned throughout this talk and um, they're there for reference if you wanna learn more.